Uh, okay. what are we doing? We're, we're hot. We're hot. Hot. Okay, cool. Um, what the fuck? Okay, well, welcome back to whatever we're going to talk about today. <laughs> I'm Adam. I'm Joe. And currently we're talking about a um a book that we're reading. I'd read it before, recommended it to Joe. He jumped at the idea. I think it's an important uh important book. Um and that's Amusing Ourselves to Death by Neil Postman. We already talked about chapter 1 which went a lot longer than we thought it was going to, uh, and we had a lot to say about chapter two. So that's what we're going to go through mostly today. And then hopefully as we progress, we can lump some chapters together and not have such exhaustive conversations about them, but it, it's hard not to. <laughs> yeah. We'll uh, see how far we, we get today. And um, unfortunately we did read this a number of days ago now. So we'll see how, how fresh it is for us. But uh, chapter two, media as epistemology. Which follows, chapter one is media, is the meta, media, medium is the metaphor, right? Yep. The medium is the metaphor. And now we're, now we're saying media as epistemology. Joe, can you define epistemology for anybody who d isn't familiar with that phrase? Hmm. <laughs> You can either free, you know, like freestyle it, or you can look it up. Uh, well, I'll try to give a, a pretty, pretty basic understanding. I don't know epistemology. I don't. Know, I don't remember how it translates in Greek, but kind of the discovery of knowledge and how we attain knowledge. Yes. In a very, very basic sense, I suppose. I don't know if you have any, without looking it up, if you have a quick definition of your own. Oh, you're right about the etymology being from Greek word for knowledge. I think it's it's just sort of it's a philosophical term about the theory of knowledge, and I think epistemology is sort of this look into what differs between justified belief or real things and opinion of things and how we understand reality based on that knowledge and so one thing that i talked about just off air was this movement of street epistemology which is about using the socratic method among other things to try and question people's firmly held beliefs a main one being their religious beliefs or faith and saying what evidence is there that we can point to besides you saying I have faith, that's all the evidence I need, or we have to look at things from a logical, rational perspective and try, and this can go from faith or religion or politics or any number of held opinions that people have. And it's trying to break down, not break them down or break down their beliefs or anything, but trying to understand what truisms are the building blocks that those belief systems are built upon and and finding out what that epistemology or what that knowledge is that we know and asking how can we know using either the scientific method or whatever else how can we know these things and do we know them and if we do what does that mean and how does that fit into this whatever specific belief you are we're talking about I forget that you had mentioned that where did where did you run into that um Street I was reading a epistemology. I was reading a guide about uh, street epistemology. So, how did you land on that? Did you had you already heard of? You'd already heard. Uh, of it? No, I I don't know if it was because I was looking it up in relation to this chapter, or like I saw it. I saw it on the internet. I saw it on Reddit or something, and I found this guide, and uh, I was just going through it. And it, it's based from a doctor who wrote a book that was called, um, like, 
how to create atheists uh, or something, which sounds <laughs> which sounds bad, but it, the its uh, goal is noble, I would say. And um, let me see if I can. Uh, so maybe I I mean. <laughs> Noble pursuits. I don't know anything about anybody who's affiliated with this, uh, this website or this even uh, this movement. But there's a complete street epistemology guide: how to talk about beliefs. Um, the term street epi epistemology originates in Dr. Peter Boghossian's book, A Manual for Creating Atheists. He describes how people often use faith as an Peter epistemology. Bogosian? Is that what it is? Name sounds familiar. Yeah. Yes, Peter Bogosian. Uh, we've we've deviated from the thing, but I only brought that up because we're <laughs> going to be talking about epistemologies because the chapter is about media as epistemology, and I wanted to have kind of a, a, a passing understanding of what that means in the context of this show and the book that we're discussing. Okay, well, let's just dive in, I suppose. Sure. Um, I could just pick one of the passages, or if you had any any general thoughts that you wanted to lay on this chapter. Well, I liked this chapter uh, a great deal, and going back through it just even skimming through it it does bring me to this idea of how we're structuring truth one of the things i've recorded on my own is this idea about the erosion of reality as we know it and um i think it, because truth is somehow unattainable now or people have their own truths that they say, I'm just speaking my truth. This is, that's my truth. And, and even putting qualifiers to what truth is not only demeans the concept of tr truism or reality, mm -hmm. but it actually then creates an environment for people to work and live and discuss in a, a world that is absent what for many 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 years centuries uh we've understood what truth means now in relation to that that street epistemology it's like some people the whatever their religion is if it's hinduism or buddhism or uh, judaism or christianity or you know islam or something they understand that as a truth either that's the way or they or they understand it as a more um modern version of it's you know a series of stories and parables with characters that existed and stories that were true but they're used as metaphors to teach lessons about how to behave and conduct one's life but they some other people take it as as fact as that's what happens and it's the word of god or it's whatever else and um we've sort of now people have said live in a post truth era maybe this as postman would say is from television and now i might say it might be from television leading to the internet leading to social media and as we're going to discuss in here he sort of on some level places a publication and printing and writing the written word because that's how we've documented history for so long and documented scientific uh um what's the word uh what's the word i'm looking for joe <laughs> sorry man i would have stepped in if i knew it <laughs> uh discoveries i suppose uh and we have written count of those things that and and they're again provable in the future 
by doing the same thing so we and then we now understand that is what's real and what's true and then we can document it and save it and re retell it and show people and produce that and that's accepted as true and now and this we're going i'm jumping a little far ahead i would make the argument that i think neil postman would make too is that now because of the internet and social media the way that television was an epistemology or a truth of the image versus the written word which he sort of sanctifies now on the internet we have a mixture of the written word and the thing so now the written word doesn't even have any uh, of the same importance that he says it did at his time or at other points in history um, which we'll talk about in chapters three and four uh in the importance of literacy and the written word and how that shapes how we understand the world but uh with the internet and social media and quote unquote fake news and whatever else and even being able to say that and be earnest about it has actually eroded any concept of truth at a mass level So those are my initial thoughts. <laughs> we can talk through some some sections here with some pages, read, read some of the thing. And then as if we get to the end, we're sort of going to just discuss stuff as we go. And uh, I know Joe has a, a lot to say. So uh, I... Well, maybe not notes. as much as you ever. <laughs> oh. <laughs> God, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> say that. Say your favorite favorite thing to say about me. No, it's okay. You're insufferable. That's Joe's it's favorite thing to say about me. <laughs> I just like to say it because I know how. I know you like to take that to heart. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I wish I had taken a little bit better notes here. I did. Um. Like these, some of these are a little bit vague, so I'm trying to even remember why I wrote this down, but something that I thought <laughs> was funny in the beginning. So I think he was talking about, um, well, like I said, he, he talked about resonance and then three different cases of truth telling. And he talked about different examples <clears throat> of our truth. And I think he started, well, I think the first example he was talking about was giving sermons and proverbs. And then he kind of took that and yes. kind of talked about how communication has evolved to from the spoken word, the written word, or from the oral word to the written word. And, yes. Uh, so he talked about how, well, I guess, the particular context matters. And I thought something that I thought was funny was when he talked about we don't use sermons or proverbs or whatever when we're, like, in a courtroom. Yeah. <laughs> so Right. Uh, do you have his examples of of those, uh, no, it those was, parables? I do not. It was okay. well, it was over like a period of the first like number of pages. So yeah, yeah. So he's talking about a ambiguous tribe of primitive people where disputes are, uh, sort of deciphered and figured out via coming to a chief or a, a someone who would has memorized all these phrases and parables and teachings like what i mentioned about a preacher or the bible or something like that where they have this encyclopedic knowledge of some often poetic purpley way using metaphor or whatever else to give them something and you know one of the things he says is you know possession is nine tenths of the law or first come first serve uh one of these could be like Hammurabi's law about like an eye for an eye at, uh what, what is it? tooth for tooth or something eye for an eye you free i don't fucking know whatever whatever <laughs> and um they would use those and because they're coming from someone who's memorized all these things and has this great experience and has authority and people trust and look up to that that's now truth if he says eye for an eye then i'm justified in in taking what was taken from me if he says first come first serve then even though something doesn't belong to 
one of these tribe members, but someone or whatever, they, they get it because they were first, right? And they take that as, as truth, right? So those are, those are a couple that are in there. But as you described, he points out, well, what does he point out? Well, I was going to read a little passage here that, that kind of went along with what you said. Great. So, the wise Solomon, we are told in First Kings we knew 3,000 proverbs. Can you give a page number? 25. Okay. At the, the first section here at the top. The end okay, of that sorry. Paragraph. Got it, got it, got it. In a print culture, people with such a talent are thought to be quaint at best, more likely pompous bores. In a purely oral culture, a high value is placed upon the power to memorize. For where there are no written words, the human mind must function as a mobile library. To forget how something is to be said or done is a danger to the community and a gross form of stupidity. In a print culture, the memorization of a poem, a menu, a law, or most anything else is merely charming. Is almost always functionally irrelevant and certainly not considered a sign of high intelligence. So yeah, that that um, I don't know, kind kind of outlines a, a key difference in a culture revolved around oral word versus how we have transitioned. Well, I guess we're past the print word a little bit now, but a <laughs> culture or, yeah. or, oriented around print. Yeah. You know what's interesting, and this is maybe resonance and it's about context of things, is because part of. Did you want to tell everybody what was meant by resonance? We talked about that before we started, so. Sure. Uh, Postman quotes uh, Northrop Fry, who had written about what he called resonance. He says. Through resonance, a particular statement in a particular context acquires a universal significance. What I wanted to bring is is the context of who is writing it or who is saying it is incredibly important into how we judge its validity. So, for example, Solomon or the tribe leader would have great importance and authority so their word is different than the child or like a child's saying that or even a common folk and throughout history that's changed now people that were writing all of our historical documents that we take as truth depictions of the revolutionary war or the 1812 or the hundred years war or the crusades or any of these other things that were saying this is what happened this is a historical account of what actually went on, and that's how we understand those things. We do have to question where they are originating from. The reason I bring that up is because now people almost put no importance on that necessarily because they don't, someone could write a slew of lies, right? But it's in the written word. So then Postman might be like, it's, that's fine, and it holds significance. But we're not questioning enough where it's coming from and what that particular context is a particular statement in a particular context and people were able to write lies all the time i think it was quite common still is and it should be i mean it's fine but we have to get better at working around those which I think largely we failed to do. Now, the other thing is when you have someone of particular significance where people do put importance in the things that they say and they do and they write, even if they're lying or what they're saying is not true because of that significance, even today, they put, they understand that is true. Even if they, so they say he, he's the president. So I, I have to like believe what the president says because this is a position of power or authority or they're the the bearer of truth. And it's really, on one level, I'm trying to place the importance, uh, like saying it's important to know when someone is valid in, in what they are saying versus what mm -hmm. they are not. And their position in society is, irrele is relevant to that. But there are many 
many a street corner vagrant could speak more truth than the king. Uh, in fact, that might be more common, right? Because of the nature of power sure. dynamics. And yet, it's much easier to uh, sort of avoid or disagree with the vagrant or the homeless man mm -hmm. or the uh, sandals wearing carpenter of myth that he's a crackpot. He's just a conspiracy theorist. He's, he doesn't have a pedestal, so he has no grounds to stand on. In some ways, me just screaming into a microphone to you, Joe, where I think I'm speaking at crazy truth, People are going to think my dad thinks I'm like a conspiracy nut or like I'm, you know, some out there guy. And because the nature of who I am doesn't uh, afford me the, the significance that some of the things I say uh, deserve. Sure. People don't like to believe Satanists and anarchists. Uh -huh. But Got him. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Satan, the Satanism, the bringer of knowledge, the bringer of light. <laughs> Lucifer, the light bringer, knowledge bringer, the arbiter of truth. Yeah, Satan wants everyone to know what's real. It's become particularly hard to weigh how we discern um, who is an expert and who isn't. And we sure we like to believe we're inclined to believe people that are experts on subjects, but at the same time, we won't, we don't want to just take their word for everything, you know? Yeah. Who's that guy that convinced you about the alien stuff? The recent stuff? Uh, no, like, no, no, no. The, a guy was on JRE and you, I think like, this is oh. the guy like he's I, he's if he knows like he, he's lying like i don't the know physicist. yeah well there's several physicists who are aliens peoples it's interesting because usually they so they start as doubters and they're going into it to prove that that's not ex I'm, a I'm a nuclear physicist or whatever and i or an astrological physicist or whatever it, whatever else and they're saying i what want to do bob lazar Yes, that's who you like. It's, to convince it's, uh, you. it's pretty convincing. <laughs> Did you well, right, check but, it out? But that's, are you but, familiar and, with and, him? Well, yeah, you, you put it on one time. But you know, someone like David Icke, who's a former soccer player who now writes crazy books about coronavirus and 5G and the reptilian overlords and the Illuminati and, the, and all of this wackadoo, schmackadoo shit, he's you know working in that that realm and so if you believe him as knowing these things then you're like great but he could and he might very well believe them but you know questioning whether questioning its validity i think is is uh, important well it's um yeah it's become quite difficult um you know especially when you're someone like myself who not really an expert in anything yet. I'm still working at a career going. I don't even have the undergrad yet. So I look up to these people. You think, oh, this guy's a, a doctor or whatever. I should be inclined yeah. to take their opinion somewhat seriously. But now yes. we have, I don't know, like a good example is one of our things talking about pandemic, And he was talking about how that doctor, very one of the top scientists, right? It's yeah. Like, well, sure a a scientist i'm not i'm not sure who's who's calling this person a top scientist but yeah it, it becomes difficult to find out uh who to believe and i guess Ooh. i mean i don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole that'll that'll bring us somewhere else but yeah one of the things i wanted to say though is that experts that we look to are sometimes wrong and then they tried to correct that, right? So if we talk about coronavirus and Fauci might be an extra, but maybe he's not. Maybe people at World Health Organization or CDC who studied these things for years and years and years, they've been wrong about things in the past and they tried to then correct their, you know, things that were incorrect. Yeah, you know, Galileo, would, Einstein or Newton or whoever, at certain points, the way we understood how the universe works or how our solar system works or how our own planet works or other celestial bodies has changed as we've been able to prove mm -hmm. things more, 
right for whatever and reason i feel like culture has drifted away from that of owning up to any sort of mistake that we have made and we're almost yeah. fostering the idea that it is it is not okay to be wrong so you just gotta, yeah great you gotta you gotta double down when someone comes at well, you you know <laughs> Okay, before we move on, just one more thing is that people have been talking about climate change or global warming, and people knew about it even in fossil fuel industries in the 80s and earlier. Now, the thing is, people can point to Inconvenient Truth or its sequel, or they and say, you know, none of these predictions came true. They said the waters were going to rise, and you know, back in Al Gore in the two, early 2000s, he said all of this stuff was going to happen, and it hasn't happened yet. So, I guess that you know they were wrong about everything. Just because they're wrong about one thing doesn't mean they're wrong about everything. And the thing is, you know, those things change as we learn more and gain more data and gain more knowledge and understanding and measure can measure things at, at a better rate and infer more from those measurements and yet because certain things haven't happened they're like well i guess global warming was a myth this whole time we don't need to do anything about it because they said you know the coral reefs were going to die our ecosystems were going to completely be forever altered mass extinction uh and in some ways those things are happening i mean i believe the great barrier reef is probably beyond repair at this point you used to be able to see it from space i don't know if you can don't know if you can anymore i what i mean is just because someone's wrong about a very minute specific any of the like minutia things that they're predicting or that they're saying they can be wrong about those things but r right about the general con like the 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 bigger picture here if it's coronavirus or global warming or whatever else Go ahead. Well, I was, um, there was maybe another passage here that would maybe link to a difference between a oral culture versus a written culture. Great. Or if you wanted to stick with that or move, or move on. Um, yeah, no, please. Okay, I got to decide here how much of this I want to read. It's on page 26. pretty much starts at the top of the page almost okay talking about i don't know if i want to read this whole thing here <laughs> okay i'll just read it <laughs> so talking about oral language here and making an argument but at the same time you must be able to tell from the tone of the language and what is the author's attitude toward the subject and toward the reader you must, in other words, know the difference between a joke and an argument. And in judging the quality of an argument, we must be able to do several things at once, including delaying a verdict until the entire argument is finished, holding in mind questions until you have determined where, when, or if the text answers them, and bringing to bear in the text all of your re relevant experiences as a counterargument to what is being proposed. You must also be able to withhold those parts of your knowledge and experience which, in fact, not have a bearing on the argument and preparing yourself to do all this you must have divested yourself of the belief that words are magical and above all have learned to negotiate the world of abstractions for there are very few phrases and sentences in this book that require you to call the forth call forth concrete images in a print culture we are apt to say of people who are not intelligent that we must draw them pictures so that they may be able to understand Intelligence implies that one can dwell comfortably without pictures in a field of concepts and generalizations. So, I mean, if we take that in the context of just the title of the chapter, media is epistem epistemology, we're talking about how a difference between an oral culture and a culture based around print. I mean, that was just one paragraph, and he points out many different factors of all the different kind of gymnastics you're doing in your mind as you're listening to someone's argument. And frankly, when you when you read that, I'm thinking, yeah, yes, that that is quite 
<laughs> quite difficult to do all those things when you were listening to someone making an argument. It actually points, and I'm interested if you agree or disagree, I think it points to that notion of that movement of street epistemology and where it really is, he stresses the importance of like withholding your beliefs and to then get to the point, withholding even your skepticism or your experiences to see if what's presented to you seems to make sense. And it's very hard to do. It's difficult for most people to try and say you would think that God created the world and seven the universe in seven days and he created man from this and a woman from this uh, and created all the animals and everything else. If someone were to, and you believe that as truth in every fiber of your being, and someone is to tell you, hey, you know, we evolved through history from common ancestors that we can trace and we can model this whole theory of evolution on a biological level. Uh, so maybe we came from a pre human primate similar to a pre chimp primate in a, in a Homo erectus, pre Homo sapien, or homunculi, or, or any other, you know, pre human primate that we can draw a lineage there that connects us to this thing and draw a line through history if someone were to tell you that even if you presented all the evidence there if they don't withhold their belief that god created everything they're not you're, there's no way you can convince them that that's true you can give them all the proof in the world you can show them pictures you can tell them everything it sounds like a pretty yeah. pretty common problem we've been having but, yes but but so it, it is important to withhold your things. I think I have a problem with this where I should probably withhold my political or you know economic ideas and and withhold those until I see someone present the counter argument or their argument for their system of ideologies yes. and understand where they're coming from instead of almost instantly and innately rejecting it because i disagree yeah, so I i'm not then i'm no sort of point to a specific example with you doing that or how i, I vaguely remember it but i think we were talking about self-help books which i am a i read sometimes and you you read never pretty much never <laughs> and um i was speaking of their importance and uh, I, I know you, you, uh, you know they can be helpful, but for whatever reason you have some perceptions about them, which may be accurate, but off puts you to reading them all together. And I remember one time you said something along the lines of, I don't remember which novel, or I don't know which book we were talking about, but you said, yeah, I think maybe I could read that book, but if I went into it completely with a blank slate, without any preconceived notions and, to, and no critiquing it until the book was finished. And you said that, and I don't think I commented, but I remember thinking, like, shouldn't we be doing that with most things that we ingest, I guess? Yes. <laughs> I don't have much I thought you were to say about that. I thought you were going to say something uh, much worse about me. No, because <laughs> that was, that was actually a story of me like admitting to that. That's what I should do to under. That's like in line with what yeah, I was just talking were, about. Uh, yeah, it was. I mean, you you were very cognizant of uh, what you should be doing, but you weren't uh, taking your own advice necessarily. Correct. Correct. You know, there's a lot in this chapter. Just jumping back, amusing ourselves to death, that we can talk about at length in, in in different contexts here um do you remember what some of the other examples he had he had given if, if there's the tribe or there's you know proverbs or solomon or whatever or written word is there more does he do one in this chapter about television specifically this is this next one's on page 28 to 29 um, I'm just going to read from what I wrote down here. I don't know sure. the rest of the context around it, but hopefully this is enough. 
I am also aware of television's potential for creating a theater for the masses, a subject which, in my opinion, has not been taken seriously enough. There are also claims that whatever power television might have to undermine rational discourse, its emotional power is so great that it could, that it could arouse sentiment against the Vietnam War or against more virulent forms of racism. These and other beneficial possibilities are not to be taken lightly. Yeah. Why did that jump out to you? Well, I guess I don't remember what the rest of this page said here, but that was to tie back to we went from the oral word to the written word, and this is one of the first points talking about the next jump to a system of communication based around, I guess... I don't want this to just say television, but uh, a new medium. I'm sure, I'll just say television, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, and he focused on okay to undermine rational discourse. Its emotional power is so great, and I just thought that was interesting. I don't think I don't know if I were to critique these different mediums of communication, my Initial thought wouldn't have been, oh, television is so powerful because of the emotional power that it can create and arouse in the in the individual. Yeah. And I guess to link this to something else that we talked about, I don't know what we were talking about, but we were talking about, um, what was it, a presidential debate between the JFK and was it Nixon? Yes. No. Yes. So how will that, that change in the medium for um, distributing news? It did have a, I guess probably had a very strong emotional impact on the viewers. So if I think about it in that example, I think the, his point becomes very easy to see. Mm. Yeah. Well, I think the what he says about the Vietnam War is important. He's bringing this up to not be like a curmudgeon who's just anti-television. You know, he's trying to address that he's aware of the potential benefits because a lot of the book is pointing out the harms that come along mm -hmm. with it right yeah that's how and, i don't want to jump ahead but at the end of chapter five he goes this because that was the end of part one of the book so then he goes in part two uh, he's that's his goal for my guess for the remainder of the book is to go through these negatives and why a step towards this culture based upon television is been largely negative yeah you know and the the emotional power also relates i, I think he's giving credence to the power of like art for example or storytelling even in traditional theater and plays you know there there's ways to convey a, a, a even a fictional story that evokes something and he's recognizing that power and bringing that power to the masses on a broader scale with television is, is important with the vietnam war you know that people had the war war footage of like journalists or war photographers or people in vietnam on their television sets every night you know now we don't see we don't see televised combat or anything of say the war on terrorism or the you know war in iraq or afghanistan we've moved away from that and i have a feeling i know why that is but people saw the vietnam war and it brought the one it humanized uh you know the vietnamese people it also really showed the soldiers that were drafted that were sent there not on their own volition who are being killed you know daily and nightly news would read the names of all the american soldiers who who died in the a given day or during the Vietnam War. And because that was so widely broadcast, it really gave 
ammunition to a movement and and gave people an insight into a movement that people would have traditionally dismissed as the radical left or the hippies or whatever else and saying you know these guys might have these people might have a point that we're killing our our sons and our fathers and our brothers and all these people that were drafted and for what and they were very aware of that now that's it does have emotional power emotional power also has vast dangerous implications because emotional power using to to stoke fear is very dangerous but to stoke empathy is very nice uh, or can be very good using uh the emotional power is is a sort of a double edged sword in that one just thinking about how much easier it is to stoke fear rather than invoke empathy yeah here's the structure well, I feel like this, the structure is also involved if you're trying to invoke empathy. Like, how how would you invoke invoke empathy? Like, well, because with how how media is displayed, it's just one thing, and then it's the next thing, and it's the next thing. And if we don't ruminate on one idea, I don't even know. Just because the content is supposed to invoke something empathic and human for you. But with the structure of television, just kind of moving on to the next thing, what was it in the in the beginning you talked about, and now this? I think that structure would make it even harder to invoke that quality of empathy. Have you ever watched the nightly news or anything like that, even recently? No. So, like uh, the news that's on before Jeopardy, I'll I'll catch snippets of, and they'll usually end on a a feel good story right mm-hmm. but earlier they were talking about coronavirus or they'll they'll talk about oh this this girl who's a, a cheerleader her her twin brother is um rather disabled and they did a story about how you know she got everybody at the school to make him prom king and then in secret like without her knowing the rest of the school got everyone to vote for her as prom queen and like surprised them both and that was like almost bringing my mom to tears now that's not empathy necessarily it's just a a, a heartfelt like feel good story but they do try and one to manipulate people into into doing that and it's easy to manipulate people both ways one of the things I, I brought up was humanizing you know the Viet Cong or the Vietnamese people if we can show things that show what it's like for our soldiers in a way that shows the similarities between the Viet Cong and Vietnamese fighters and the American fighters. And if you can are able to draw that that line that they're not so different from us, it seems like they're both they're at, on one level being there against their will, they're being attacked, they're attacking, and there's a humanizing factor of saying like you're not so different you and i and getting people to uh feel that in a major way i think instead of trying to instill the differences which is a common tactic you you try and show that you can invoke empathy in that way because if you get people feeling about the American soldier and then get them to draw the line between an American soldier and a Vietnamese soldier, then they can start to care about the Vietnamese soldier. I also want to say one of the benefits of, of, of having technology now, if we look at Rodney King or we look at George Floyd or anything else, when, we ha- when we're able to disseminate and broadcast those things that happen we've seen what kind of movements that can uh arise for better or for worse and there is always the question of whether it's better or for the better or for the worse i i think the emotional power of the rodney king footage uh and the emotional power of the George Floyd footage was very, very important. 
to what came next. Right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> At least a little bit. Um, well, little so bit. 20, 29 is uh, the end of that chapter. Which then we, we'll go on to talk about three and four later. I don't know how long we've been going. It's been 47 minutes. Okay. We could probably get into three and see how, how short or long that takes. Um, okay, do you want to end two here, or do you want to... Maybe we should just do some closing thoughts. I, I wanna, I'd like to hear you talk about what this chapter is and what even just the term media as epistemology is for you and what how you understand epistemology and, okay. and sort of um, what has come... Give me a come... moment here. I did have another passage left in my notes here, but I need to... Maybe go to the page to get a bit more context. Mm, and I'll have something to read at, at uh, as we close off this, this okay. chapter. Well, I'm just going to read this passage. You got some thoughts, let it rip. We must be careful in praising or condemning because the future may hold surprises for us. The invention of the printing press itself is a paradigmatic example. Typography, fo typography fostered the modern idea of individuality, but it destroyed the medieval sense of community and integration. Typography created prose, but made poetry into an exotic and elitist form of expression. Typography made modern science possible, but transformed religious sensibility into mere superstition. Typography assisted in the growth of the nation state, but thereby made patriotism into a sordid, if not lethal, emotion. Where was that from? The middle of page 29. Okay. Like the very center, starting with yep. we. I, I see that. Yeah. Well, and this is what we've talked about is, or I've talked about it, it's a double-edged sword of it all. Yeah, I think this is kind of a largely a, a rehash, I guess, of what we've already talked about in the last uh, 45 or so minutes here. Well, it was nice to have those examples that he put in, mm -hmm. I think. Um, <clears throat> How do you feel about Typography fostered the modern idea of individuality. Why do you think he said that? And I guess I'm a little curious because I was just thinking to myself, I'm not I'm not sure why why he included that in the closing of this chapter here. Yeah. The, what do you make of the medieval sense of community and integration <laughs> as just the flip side to this concept of individuality and its relation to typ topography? I maybe could have riffed off of the community integration because, I mean, if if the beginning of the chapter he was talking about all these community, social gatherings sermons the well in the time of the oral culture that was that was a different that was a more i think community community based culture you had to arrive show up and be there listening and mm -hmm. oh okay so i mean maybe guess maybe this individuality is because now we had this new method for one person to just write one thing and then distribute it to upon infinite amounts of people. That's um, my instinct as well. I'm not sure exactly why he would have said medieval. I can maybe, it might be a stretch, but to go back to, what was it? Another passage that I had already read about 
the different kind of uh, mental gymnastics you need to kind of process in your mind when you're listening to an argument. And I think Mm -hmm. when you have all those factors, I think a person can be more prone to manipulation as opposed to the written word. It's much easier to go back and reread and critique because, because you have it. You have it right there in front of you. Yeah. It takes out the... I don't know, dare I say, more manipulative aspects of speech and rhetoric. Thanks. I agree. My instinct in fostering the modern idea of individuality is that the written word was largely coming from an individual source on what the things that they thought or felt or knew or whatever. And oftentimes reading is an independent, mm. solitary sure. uh, yeah. thing, which, which you pointed to. Well, but you pointed it to with community because you're all like there listening mm-hmm. to one guy, you know, listening yeah. to whoever. But like reading is, is usually a, a, a um, individual activity, right? And that, that's, that's, you know, without getting too much into it, that's what my gut would say is what that meant to intellectualize really what he meant about like the modern idea of individuality. I, I that would be a, a gr- at greater length because I'm not sure that topography is, is necessarily its roots, but I understand I'm understanding it in the context of like what, what is being written and how it is being consumed. I think it was a great point about how, you know, withholding, if you, it's, it's in some ways easier to withhold all those mental gymnastics or preconceived notions or, or opinions on things in writing than it, one, because when you're, when you're reading something, you don't just, I get, I mean, some people might just stop reading and say, no, this is wrong, but you know, <laughs> sometimes people might wait to get to a certain point and in reading inherently has a beginning and an end in general. And so you might read a whole book or a whole essay or a whole thing versus speech can be in some ways infinite. An oral argument can be in some ways infinite and you can choose to end it whenever you want. In some ways you can in written too. I suppose that's um, true. You can actually see the structure of the written word as opposed to just spoken word. You're kind of just waiting there. <laughs> right. And and then your feelings are you you want to jump in or you want to disagree or you or else, um, which we'll get to in talking about debates and rebuttals and you know formal uh, institutional formal you know forms of, of of debate or an argument and what those impose because in some ways in a formal debate with timed sections. It also has, like reading, a, a beginning and an end, and then a, a constructed response with, you know, maybe some more, uh, even off the cuff stuff. But it has sort of these defining things that are more easily decipherable and traceable, and easier to like understand on a level versus just we're we're arguing about something. But I think you had a great point about being able to read it again. You know what I mean? And saying, you know, you can, if you, if you read something and you don't even understand it, just even one sentence, you can go back and say, wait, wait, what? And I can just reread mm-hmm. a sentence or read a paragraph or read, read a page. And sure, you can ask somebody, <clears throat> I'm going to lose my voice. And you can ask somebody, you repeat that. Usually difficult for that person to repeat it exactly as they did. Uh, and even having done so that's not always the same as, as having it so i think that was um really important sure. and then being able to critique I mean, it even when i'm here i can i can read you the passage or i can tell you what page it's on and you can read along with me i think there's a well a huge difference if we're talking about the context of epistemology and how, how you're attaining that knowledge between me just telling you and you being able to read it sure Sure. You know, I, I, do you want to move on from this chapter now? We're maybe close to an hour. 
Yeah, we're at 57 minutes, but you did say you had something to maybe close with this chapter here. Yeah, but it, it's it's just the last paragraph, so we've just basically read all of page 29. <laughs> but uh, do, do you want to read the last paragraph? Uh, you, you got it. Or you said you're losing I, your voice. Is that why you want me to read it? No, I just think I've talked enough. <laughs> that's That's often going to be the case, man. Well, here's the idea is I'll read the the last paragraph and then you'll talk about it. Like when you read and then I talk about it. Lay it on me. <laughs> now, when when we're reading these things out loud, we're saying my or I or whatever. That's Neil Postman. So he's writing it. It's his book. So I, <laughs> obviously my I, I wrote point. this this is let me tell you yeah, okay. I am. <laughs> but i just want to make obviously my point of view i'm saying obviously neil postman's point of view obviously my point of view is that the 400 year imperial dominance of topography was of far greater benefit than deficit most of our modern ideas about the uses of the intellect were formed by the printed word as were our ideas about education knowledge truth and information I will try to demonstrate that as, a top, as topography moves to the periphery of our culture and television takes its place at the center, the seriousness, clarity, and above all, value of public discourse dangerously declines. On what benefits may come from other directions, one must keep an open mind. Um, I feel like this... Kind of seems similar to how he ends chapter five later on. It's kind of giving a little bit. I want to say foreshadowing, but he's leading on to. Sort of the kind of. Argument that he's going to lay down in the preceding chapters. And kind of give a. Uh, well, I would say, I guess I could say give a pros and cons analysis of, you know, topography-oriented culture versus one based around television. Um, Like we've already said, he, uh, largely what he's going to discuss is going to be negative. I don't know if, if that's because, well, it is mostly negative and he doesn't explore some of the pros or, or what, I guess, I guess we'll find out, but... What do you make of the uses of the intellect were formed by the printed word as were education, knowledge, truth, and information, and then contrast that with um, the television and the serious clarity and value? I mean, those aren't conflicting things. I'm just, the way he lists them out, I'm sort of drawing um, a uh, connection between them hmm. is is the written word much greater in seriousness clarity and or just those two than the televised word Yes. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I don't want to just straight up agree with him because I think, um, well, I think some of the, the critiques on this book is that he, he sees the written word as something that's very, um, I don't know, he, ha he holds it in higher regard and maybe in doing so reveals some of his own biases. Maybe, Correct. maybe so. I'm yet to make that determination. But yes, he is speaking very highly of of uh, the written word. I mean, he says, I mean, just him saying the intellect, like education, our ideas about education, knowledge, truth, and information, they came from the printed word, and that's that's how... That's kind of the paradigm that we operate under in society currently. 
before we've drifted away to this television-based culture. Yeah, which, I mean, again, you might not agree with. And like I said about uh, when we were, you, the thing you read about topography fostering the modern idea of individuality, you know, I think there's there's more to it than that. Uh, I don't know if he would agree or, or disagree, you know, and, and forming the intellect and our ideas about education, knowledge, truth, and information, I think there's there's more to it than merely topography. We're saying that word a lot. Um, it, but, no uses it a lot. Um, yeah. Do, do you know if you've ever seen anything, if your mom's watching news, for example, where it appears extremely serious or extremely clear in what's being portrayed? Feel like I need more context than that. I mean, what do you mean Whoa. when you say clear? Linear. Uh, well, when we're understandable. using the medium of television, when and then you're saying clear, there's a lot more other factors kind of going around that I that I think about. There, well, there's the person delivering, you know, the content itself. I could maybe be looking at. We're talking about news, whatever television news station. Maybe I'm thinking what what agenda they have, what propaganda is being said to me. So clear in terms of the content itself or what they hope that I take away or what I'm personally just myself taking away. Just oh, independent mm -hmm. critique. So I'm just trying to understand what you mean by by clear because if we're talking about within television, there's just suddenly more strings pulling on my thoughts i guess yeah what do you think neil postman means when he says clarity this is just a stab in the dark but maybe less prone to manipulation Okay. Is the written word have clarity? Sure, but in if we're if we're gonna compare it to the spoken word versus yeah. television as a medium, certainly much more clarity than those than those two. Yeah. But the reason I brought that up is, is like if I think about I don't really watch news, main main mainstream news very much. Uh just bits and pieces, but like if you watch if you're a Fox fan and you like Tucker Carlson or, or Bill O'Reilly, um or if you like Rachel Maddow or you like who you know, have someone else, someone on a different political spectrum who's, you know, giving you the news, there is an air of seriousness. There's an air of clarity. I'm of the opinion that it's usually feigned seriousness uh, or constructed seriousness or fake seriousness. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's just it's being serious about things that aren't serious. So you take them seriously. Like I don't think Ben Shapiro should be taken seriously about many of the things he says, but he's presenting them in a serious way. So he's a serious guy saying serious things seriously, and people take that seriously. Seriously, <laughs> I'm, I'm being super serial right now. Um, I'll tell you what. I, I have my I have dinner ready. Uh, I was asked if I can take a break. Uh, I mean, I mommy we, made dinner. Yeah, <laughs> yeah my. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I think we we covered quite a bit. I think that was that was sort of already our our closing statements a little bit. Um. So yeah, we uh took a fair amount of time talking about chapter two, much like we did on chapter one. But I feel like um these first two are are very important in what he's going to lay down lay out for for the rest of the book. I think this is kind of uh. He's building a foundation here. And uh, in the next two chapters, hopefully, which we'll try to get in in the next episode here, um, he's devoted to more of a historical context and is going to give, uh, so I guess, some historical evidence talking about typographic America and what was it? The typographic mind, I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Before he then moves on to what we get is about television and as the main section and the second half of the book here. Yeah. I'd like to say if, if, if anyone ever listens, what, what it would be great if you have read the book or are reading the book along with us. So like we said, if you can get to these pages and get to these sections and read them as we read them aloud, that can uh, be really great. Uh, the goal you know, on one level is for exposure of this book. Uh, I'd hope that we can discuss things in a way and bring our own thoughts to it in a way while giving a kind of a, a, a good base understanding of what the chapter's about or what's being said in the book and then sort of talking about them more. So even if you don't want to read the book, you could come away with this, having a better understanding about these concepts. And I don't know if we're doing a good job, but we're going to keep trying. Okay, so I guess that is uh what we've talked about today. <laughs> <laughs> I am Joe Like. I'm Adam Bunky. Yeah, your your voice is much more sultry than mine with that high quality mic you got there. I'm Adam Bunky. Okay, thank you for joining us. We will be back after Bunky's family dinner. Yeah, I actually have been thinking about record. I've been thinking about recording some like some sexy stuff. The end. <laughs>